Okay, welcome back everybody. Um, I know it's been a long spring break, a little bit of unusual spring break. We had two weeks off. Um, just want to cover a few things before I get into the material for today's lecture. Um, first off, we know that um, with the concerns with the COVID-19 virus that um, all in-class sections have been moved to an online format. So obviously that relates to this course. We know this was a, a course where either students were in class or they were coming in a hybrid setting, either coming into class to take the exam or in watching it from afar for the lectures. Well, moving forward now, this is gonna be a total online format for this course. Um, so therefore we will not be meeting in the class um, at all the remainder of the semester. Um, all lectures will be recorded online and posted in Moodle as they have been previously. Um, also, in regards to the to the final exam, the final will be administered through ProctorTrack, um, which will be accomplished through an on through an onboarding quiz um, in Moodle, which I will put up um, probably next week or the following, so that so that we can go ahead and get everyone registered um, in, into that system into that program. Um, and obviously then the, the test will be taken through through Moodle as well. It's just going to be through through Proctor Track for proctoring. Um, so for the most part, moving forward, not, not a lot's going to change for us other than obviously we're not going to be in class and not going to be taking the exam in class. <clears throat> um, my goal is to have, have the lectures posted by no later than the Wednesday of the week of, of the relative, materi relative material. Um, obviously this week's a little different because um, because of the pushback of, of the courses from the second spring break so let's let's talk about that for a second so here we are we're in our main course we know we already covered all this stuff um, so we know we took the mid midterm exam right before spring break um, which covered chapters one through six uh, we went over the project a little bit um, of, of what, what 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 is expected of that and just to touch up on that um, Here's the project here, and then the project details with the little little web page here. So make sure everyone checks that out and starts starts getting on that. Um, I will go in and, and alter these a little bit and put a little more detail in them. But for the most part, the details are in this length here. So that that's dealing with the project. And since we're talking about the project, I want to go ahead and just move down here and just show that the project is still going to be due um, April um, the week week of April twenty seventh through May third. And I'll also go ahead when I when I update the info um, related to the project. I'll also go ahead and make the assignment tab here for students that want to turn it in early. Um, and then um, let's see here. So spring break. So here's our normal spring break right here, March 9th to March fifteenth. Um, and then here is and here would have been our first week back, but they made this spring break again. So. Um, what I'm going to do, everyone pay attention here for a second, is we're just going to move forward as if it never happened since it's an online class. Um, so meaning um, we're not going to skip chapter 7 and we're not going to knock chapter um, chapter 12 off in the end either. We're still going to cover the same amount of content as we were before. Um, it's just this week right here, the, the initial week back, which is the week we're in here, we're going to kind of crunch these two together which really is not that big of a deal because really last week, um, which which was um, spring break technically, we were just beginning chapter seven and the, and the chapter seven connect assignments and nothing was actually due until this Sunday coming up, um, March 29th at 11.59 p.m. So that's still an adequate amount of time to get these assignments in. Um, I'm doing it this way because I think it just makes more sense and it'll be easier on on the student and the teacher to do it this way and keep keep everything rolling. Um, fortunate fortunate um, for us that the class that I set it up this way with with nothing being due last week, so we're we're good to go in terms of when assignments are due. Um, so obviously this this week will be a little bit of a crunch, squeezing seven in, but just know that um, chapter seven is due due this Sunday. But then after this week, we'll be back on our normal on our normal um, rotation, a normal normal schedule moving forward. We'll have a little bit more time to focus in on each chapter um, because we know um, chapter eight connected assignments aren't going to be due until next Sunday. So we still we still have good time here. We're on a good good time frame. Um, 
I know you also say that all the courses opened up. It has been the, the whole semester. I don't know if anyone's noticed, but whole courses opened up. So um, same same holds true for the Connect. So feel free if you feel that you're retaining the, the information. If you want to read ahead and, and try to work ahead, that, that's fine. I have no problem with that, um, with the Connect assignments or with the project that's due the week before um, the final exam. Um, the only only thing that I'll say about that is that the final exam will not be available until actual finals week. So that's the only assignment that has to be um, taken at the actual week that it's slated for. But besides that, just feel free to work away and 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 work at the pace that you see fit. Or this is an online course. I have no problem with that. Um, also, I just want to point out before, one last thing before I get into get into the lecture that um, my office hours still hold true. Obviously, I'm not gonna be in the office, um, but I will be by my computer during those those slated times. So just refer to the syllabus if you have a question about when my office hours are. And like I said, I'll be, be available for those for immediate response. And um, even if it's not my office hours, shoot me an email, I'll check my email daily. Um, but obviously if it's out of the office hours, expect a little bit of more of a delayed response, not too much, but I just ask roughly 24 hours for a turnaround, maybe a little little longer on weekends. But my main point is just to let y'all know I'm, I'm here for you if you have any questions or concerns relating to anything related to this course. Um, so, just want to make sure we know we are starting on chapter seven. So we have chapter seven through twelve to cover the, the back half of back half of the material. So let's go ahead and get started on chapter seven here. So chapter seven. Chapter seven is dealing with fiduciary funds. Um, so we know um, in the previous six chapters we covered the five governmental funds. And then we covered the two fiduciary funds. Um, and we, we also had a little broad overview of just the whole scope of the course from chapter two. So we, we are a little familiar with these fiduciary funds already. We know there's four different fiduciary funds. Um, we know we, we've, we've got a little bit of insight on these already, but obviously this chapter is gonna be a deeper dive into, into these funds. Um, so let's, let's just go ahead and get on into them here. Um, so some of our learning objectives for this chapter is going to be to identify the fiduciary funds and also describe when each is appropriate. Because if you recall, not all governments um, actually have to have all, all 11 funds that, that are actually prescribed, um, just only if it's appropriate. Um, we want to apply the accrual basis of accounting and the recording of typical transactions of private purpose trusts, investment trusts, pension and other employee benefit trust and custodial funds. So um, if you will recall um, that these four fiduciary funds do do operate on the accrual basis of accounting and the economic resource measurement focus. Um, this holds true with the two proprietary type funds that we just covered in chapter six. They also operate on the full accrual basis of accounting um, when, when recording their transactions and um, we know that this is different from the five governmental funds, which obviously operate on the um, the modified accrual, the current financial resource measurement focus. So just want to point that out here. We are operating on the full-blown accrual here for these fiduciary funds. Um, we also want to focus on how we prepare the fund basis financial statements for these fiduciary funds. And also we're going to be concerned with how um, we apply GASB standards for the measurement and reporting of investments that that is in in relation to these funds so let's look at a little overview of these fiduciary funds um, these these funds actually report resources that actually do not belong to the government um, but they are actually being held by the government as an agent or a trustee there is a general rule that relates to these type of funds um, the accrual basis and economic resource measurement focus is going to be used, as we said um, on the previous slide. And one, one, one thing that's interesting here is the account titles additions and deductions are going to be used in place of revenues and expenses. So additions and deductions instead of revenues and expenses here. So that's that's something that we've, we've not seen um, um, thus far in any of our accounting, um, accounting stuff so far. Um, pension trusts. Um, funds only reflect the obligation for pension benefits currently due to government retirees, not the obligation to future retirees. So only um, 
um, the the current two government retirees is what we're, we're going to be be focused on. So generally speaking, fiduciary activities meet the following criteria. A government either has custody of certain assets or has the ability to direct the use of the assets for the benefit of others outside the government. Or the assets are not derived from the government's own source revenue. And we know that the government's main source of revenue is, is for charges for services or tax, stuff of that sort. Um, the assets are held for the benefit of another party, either through a trust agreement in which the government is not the beneficiary, and the assets are protected from the government's creditors. So when we're in a trust agreement um, and we're, we're not the beneficiary, then obviously these assets are going to be protected from the government's creditors. Um, another agreement in which the government does not have a direct administrative or financial involvement. Um, examples could be um, include pass-through grants or tax collections for other governments. So a good example of collect tax collections for other governments is um, sales tax, monthly sales taxes. Um, we know a lot of times, like the say for the state of West Virginia, the sales tax I believe is six percent for the actual state. That's the actual state state's um, tax tax um, tax rate that's applicable to all sales within the state. Um, and we know a lot of these different municipalities that operate within the state of West Virginia also have a 1% piggyback tax that they put on top of the 6%. So if you're within these municipalities, then there's an actual effective 7% tax rate. Um, but what happens when these, these businesses that operate inside the municipalities, like so for example, if we have a company that operates within the city limits of, um, of Bluefield, um, which, which is a municipality that recognizes the 1% piggyback tax on state sales tax, then when when that when that um, entity remits its sales tax on the 20th following the month of the sale um, they're going to remit the full seven percent to the state and when the state of west virginia the, when the state tax department receives that money they're actually going to put that money into that into that little custodial fund and hold that money to be remitted to the actual municipality that had the one percent piggyback tax on it um, so that's a good example of um of such agreements when there's pass-through grants or tax collections for other governments. And we'll get more into that as we move forward in this lecture. <clears throat> so a little bit on fiduciary funds and the government-wide financial statements. Um, if you recall from earlier in this course, we've already talked about this a few more times or a few times previously, that fiduciary assets are not included in the government-wide statements. And the reason being is because the assets and the resources are not available for general use of that of that government, excuse me. They are, however, reported at the fund level and only at the fund level. So when we go, when we go about creating these government-wide financial statements, we know that the fiduciary assets are not included in them because obviously we're just we're just a third party or a trustee. So it would distort the overall um, presentation or financial position of the government body if we would include these these fiduciary assets because by the name fiduciary where it's obviously they belong to someone else that's why it's not included um, so just another little visual um, here's the little flow chart of the financial reporting process for state and local governments um, this this should look really familiar we've we've touched on this chart numerous times already in this course um, but the main thing here, let's look to the right lower portion of this chart here and this process. Um, we can see here where it says the fund basis financial statements fiduciary activities. So we obviously see that those are intact here at the fund basis level. Um, but if you would move up, if, as we move towards the process of actually building the government wide statement of net position and statement of activities, the fiduciary funds are not included in these. So just a good thing to know here, this is just a little visual of the overall process of how we move from the actual fund level to the government-wide level. So you can actually see a visual here that the fiduciary um, activities and these fund-based financial statements are not included in the government-wide statements. Um, if you recall that the fiduciary funds consist of four different fund types. Um, the first one being the pension and other employee benefit trust funds. Obviously, I think by the, just the name of this, um, it kind of gives this fund away what it is. Um, it's, it's used to report pension and other employee benefit plans that are held in the trust in which the reporting government is the trustee. 
Um, so once again, how I said the pension and other employee benefit trust funds, um, as I've always said, even previously in this course, really think of the name of the fund in which the activity is happening, because a lot of times the name can really give the activity a way of what's going on. Not always, but usually that is the case. Um, another type of these this fiduciary funds is an investment trust fund. Um, the investment trust fund is going to exist when the government is going to be the sponsor of a multi-government investment pool. Um, it is used to report the external portion of investment pools that are governed by a trust agreement. So um, the investment trust fund, that, like I said, this is where, say, we have our own government and we're going to say, okay, we're going to start an investment um, investment trust fund and we're going to see if other governments want to want to sponsor it or want to want to participate in it and make contributions to it. Um, and if they do, if they if they want to take and participate in this investment trust fund, then those proceeds that other governments outside of our body um, contribute into this fund need to be held in this investment trust fund. Um, another type of fund is the private purpose trust funds. Um, these The private purpose trust fund is used when the government is in a fiduciary relationship. Um, this relationship is going to be governed by a formal trust agreement other than those reported in a pension or investment trust fund. Um, so private purpose trust funds. So um, another another way to kind of think about this one is is how we kind of thought of the special revenue fund for that of um, for that of the governmental funds. Remember, it was used for purposes other than capital projects or debt service. So kind of the same thing here. It's going to be for those other than reported in a pension or investment trust fund. So private purpose trust funds, right? Um, <clears throat> And lastly, the custodial funds. These are going to report fiduciary activities that are not governed by formal trust arrangements. Um, a good a good fiduciary activity that's not governed by a formal trust arrangement, once again, um, could be a fund like like I used it for the example of sales tax. So that's a perfect example to where the at the state level, the state of West Virginia receives um, that piggyback one percent piggyback tax within this fund. And then they obviously remit that 1% to the relative municipalities across the state or throughout the state once they received it. Um, so that, that's a good, a good example of a custodial fund would be a sales tax that needs to be remitted or a fuel, fuel motor tax that needs to be remitted to the, to the relative municipality. Okay, a little more on private purpose trust funds. It's going to be used when the government administers funds used for beneficiaries other than the government and its citizens. For example, endowment investments providing income to be used for scholarships. Um, we've, we've talked about this private purpose trust funds. If you recall, um, when we were in the proprietary funds, or I'm sorry, I believe it was the governmental fund, but we were talking about the difference between if, if, a, if a fund was... Um, was spendable or non-expendable, and and who what the who the fund benefited? Um, we know if it benefited the government, then it needed to be either in a permanent fund or a special revenue fund. And here we are, and and I, and then we learned there also that um, if it if it's used for beneficiaries other than the government and its citizens, then it needs to be accounted for in a private purpose trust fund. So here's the, here's where we're actually getting into that that actual fund. Um, in some cases, the principal is held intact. If you recall back to the examples I was talking about um, in the prior lessons of the difference between special revenue permanent and private purpose trust funds, um, whether the portion was um, expendable or non-expendable with the principal or corpus, um, if you recall that for the private purpose trust fund, it really doesn't matter. It could be an expendable or non-expendable. Um, here, so here, here's what it's saying. In some cases, the principal is held intact. So obviously, that's where the corpus is not expendable. So these are called endowments or non-expendable funds. So an endowment is just a non-expendable fund. Only earnings on the corpus can be spent. Um, in other cases, both the principal and income can be spent or expended for specific purposes, and this would be known as expendable. So the corpus does not have to be have to be held intact. Private purpose trust versus permanent trust. Um, okay, this is this kind of tying back into what I was just getting at on the previous slide when I was referring back to when we were talking about the governmental funds, um, the difference between whether a fiduciary activity or a, acting as a trustee should be accounted for in a special revenue fund, a permanent fund, or a private purpose trust fund. Um, so here, now we're going to really focus just down between private purpose trust funds and permanent trust. 
Um, so permanent and private purpose trust funds may appear very similar, but in all reality, these two forms of trust funds have very different accounting. Um, permanent funds use the modified accrual basis of accounting, while private purpose trust funds use the accrual basis. So that's one, one huge difference. We know that because um, we know the permanent fund is a governmental fund which operates on the modified accrual and the private purse trust is a fiduciary which operates on the accrual basis. Another huge difference is um, permanent funds are included in the government-wide financial statements and private purpose, private purpose trust funds are not included in government-wide statements. Um, so big, big difference here. Obviously, if the, if the corpus has to be maintained, it's going to be accounted for in a governmental fund known as the permanent fund. Um, and if, if the principal does not have to be maintained, then that's going to be accounted for in the private purpose trust. Um, investments and trust funds. Um, there's a general rule. Investments are carried at fair value, usually measured by a quoted market price. So once again, um, this is this is nothing different than what we're used to seeing in the for-profit sector. So it, like in your principals courses or your intermediate course, um, where we have these different investments. Um, we know that, like say, if we have trading securities, like for inter an intermediate, we know that they have to be marked to market at the end of the reporting period, and then the relative gains or losses um, have to be recognized in the current period's earnings on the income statement. Well, um, same, same thing here. That's general investments have to be carried at fair value. And obviously, they're measured by or quoted in the market price because the investments have, they're, they're invested in the actively traded market. Um, the holding gains and losses are reported as a net increase or decrease in fair value of investments. So it's either a net increase or decrease in fair value in investments. Pretty straightforward. Something we should be familiar with from other courses. Okay, reporting of investment gains and losses. So unlike business accounting, the financial statements are not permitted to distinguish between realized and unrealized gains and losses. So let's stop here for a second. Um, difference between realized and unrealized losses. So what is that? Changes in value from completed exchanges is going to be realized gains and losses. Changes from year-end adjustments to fair value for investment balance is going to be unrealized gains or losses. So if you recall back to your for-profit sector um, from your principles and intermediate, most likely your intermediate course here, not your principles, would be in this this depth, I would, I would assume. But... Um, we know that realized gains and losses is, is entered into determination of net income, whereas the unrealized gains or losses is going to be is going to be entered into the other comprehensive income, which is followed below net income, and then the cumulative effect is going to be your accumulated other comprehensive income or your AOCI, which is a component of your stockholders' equity on the balance sheet. Um, so that that's what we're talking about here. Nothing's different here. Unrealized gains and losses. Um, in, in the terms of, of what constitute a, either something being a realized gains or an unrealized loss. The only difference is here is we're not permitted to distinguish between the two. But just know that realized and unrealized mean the same thing here that we're, that we're familiar with for profit. Okay, derivatives. Derivative instruments are financial contracts whose fair value is derived from the price of an underlying asset or obligation. Okay, so what's a good example of that? Let's say a government enters into a derivative contract to protect against increases in natural gas costs. In this case, the fair value of the derivative is derived from the level and volatility of natural gas prices. So that's the underlying asset is the natural gas prices. Okay. Um, derivatives include swaps, meaning interest rate swaps. Um, options would be puts and calls. Um, forward contracts and futures contracts. So these are all examples of derivatives. So how do we go about reporting derivatives? Derivative instruments are to be reported at fair value. But however, the reporting of the change in value, gains and losses, depends on the type of a derivative. There's two different types of derivatives. You can either use a derivative for hedging purposes or you can use a derivative for speculating purposes. Um, in terms of the hedging purposes, um, governments can enter into derivative contracts to mitigate the risk of economic loss arising from changes in the underlying, underlying asset or obligation. So once again, this activity is known as hedging. So um, if, we, if we think that the price of gas, let's say natural gas, like they said before, say if we bought like 100,000 
pounds of natural gas or gallons, however it's however it's measured, at um, January one, year one, and we we obviously know that natural gas, the commodity, is going to change daily in in value, the fair value. So in order to to hedge against a loss on that that those hundred thousand gallons or pounds of natural gas, um, if we're gonna if we're gonna have a uh, the contract to sell to sell 100,000 gallons of gas in three months from there, so at the end of the first quarter, then we would also want to go ahead and set up a contract to buy 100,000 gallons or 100,000 pounds of natural gas at the end of the first quarter as well to offset the, the, however it moves. Because if you're selling it and purchasing it at the same point in time, then whatever the change is is going to be a wash. You'll, the gain from the, from the sell and the loss from the purchase will offset each other and you've hedged it. And that's obviously in a perfect hedge, but that's that's long and short of how you hedge hedge a bet on on an underlying asset is you 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 could take a different position. Um, less commonly, governments may enter derivative contracts for the purpose of earning a return. Um, this is known as speculating. You're speculating it, so you're expecting something. You're speculating where a spot rate or a forward rate is going to be in the future, and you're just you're gambling on it. Um, and that that's going to be for the purpose of trying to make a gain on it instead of actually hedging your position. So that's that's big differences on hedging and speculating. Um, two different ways derivatives can be applied. Let's start with hedges. If a derivative is effective in reducing government's exposure to identifiable risk, that identifiable risk is the change in the underlying price on the fair value market. So that's the identifiable risk. So if the derivative is effective in reducing the government's exposure to that identifiable risk, then the changes in the value of that derivative are deferred. So what's that mean if the changes in value of a derivative are deferred? We know if something's recognized, it that's, that's going to be balance sheet state, balance sheet, right? If it's realized income statement. So if we're deferring something, that's going to be a balance sheet item, right? So this means the changes in value are reported in the statement of net position, which is obviously the government's version of a balance sheet, not the activity statement, which would be the income statement in the for-profit sector. So if, there, if the hedge is effective, then the value of that derivative, the changes in the value and derivative are deferred and carried on um, the statement of net position. The deferred gains or losses typically continue to be reported as deferred outflows or deferred inflows until the hedge transaction occurs or when payment is made for the equipment. Um, so obviously we're just going to just keep on deferring that on the on the statement of that position as a deferred inflow or deferred outflow when these changes in value of the derivative are deferred and then ultimately when the payment is made for the equipment um, that that's when we'll go ahead and realize it in earnings next investment derivatives also known as speculating with derivatives is going to be the changes in the value of derivatives classified as investment purposes and they're going to be reflected as investment gains or losses in the period that the value changes so um, obviously if we're once again if we're if we're going to just do an investment for speculative purposes um, then we're trying to look for it to make the gain so if that's the case if we're if we're entering into that derivative contract to try to make a gain on the change in fair value then whatever that change in fair value is for that reporting period has to be realized in earnings as an investment gain or loss in that period pension trust funds Similar to business organizations, governments commonly provide retirement benefits to employees. So I think everyone's heard of, of what a pension is. Um, but unlike businesses, governments frequently manage these pension plans. <clears throat> this activity can include investing resources contributed to the plan and even making payments to retirees. Now there are different types of pension plans. First, we have a contributory versus non-contributory funds. Uh, and this refers to whether the employee is required to contribute. So obviously some plans they are, some they're not. Um, next, we have a defined benefit plan. So under, under this defined benefit plan, the employer must pay a guaranteed level of benefit that's going to be computed using a formula. Under the defined benefit plan, the risk of additional future liability is on the employer. So th that's, that's important to know. Um, because there's two different types types of defined plans here. Defined benefit, which is the one we just went over, and the next being defined contribution plans. 
Um, under the defined contribution plan, the employer pays based on assets accumulated with investment earnings. Um, in the defined contribution plans, the risk of insufficient retirement pay is on the employee, not the employer. So big difference there between defined benefit plans and defined contribution plans. Um, defined benefit, the risk is on the employer. And defined contributions, the risk is on the employee. Um, so just be familiar with these different types of pension plans. Um, pensions have two categories of reporting. We have a plan reporting and an employer reporting. Okay, plan reporting is going to only apply to governments administering pensions. Obviously, if they don't have a if don't have their own plan that they're administering, then there's nothing to report on that plan. So, plan reporting applies only to governments administering pensions. The statement of fiduciary net position is going to report the excess of currently available resources over benefits currently payable to retired employees. So once again, that statement of fiduciary net position is going to only report the excess of currently available resources over the benefits that are currently payable to the retired employees. The statement does not report, once again, it does not report a liability for amounts expected to be paid to current employees when they retire in the future. So we're only worried about benefits currently payable to retired employees. Now the other one is employer reporting. Now, the, the employer reporting is going to apply whether a government manages its own plan or participates in a plan that's going to be administered by another government or a third party. The central issues of employer reporting are the measurement and presentation of the net pension liability and statements displaying financial position and the related recognition of pension expenditure or expense. So once again, plan reporting only applies to governments that administer their own pension plans and the employer reporting applies whether a government manages its own plan or participates in a plan administered by another government. A little more on plan reporting. So for this, once again, for pension and other post-employment benefits, um, statement of fiduciary net position. So the elements of the statement of uh, fiduciary net position is going to be assets less short-term accrued liabilities, and that's going to equal fiduciary net position. The other statement is the statement of changes in fiduciary net position, and this takes the place of an income statement. It uses the terms additions and deductions instead of revenues and expenses. So once again, we'll recall that they use additions and deductions instead of revenues and expenses. A little more on plan reporting. Additions include contributions by the sponsoring government, so money that the, the sponsoring government actually puts into the plan. Um, contributions by employees, so a lot of times employees, if anyone here has ever participated in, in a pension or retirement plan knows that most of the times it's, it's pulled out of your check um, um, before tax, so a lot of times we don't even see that money leaving our check, so those contributions by the employees are also included as additions to the, to the plan. Um, and investment earnings, investment accounting rules are going to apply, meaning mark the market at the end of the period, carried at fair value. So same, same hold true as the for-profit sector. Um, so once again, additions, contributions by both the sponsoring government and by the employees and investment earnings. Because we know we're not just putting this money in there and just letting it sit in a bank account. We're actually putting it in, into securities and investments so they can, they can earn a return. So that's what the investment earnings is talking about there. Um, the deductions are going to include benefit payments to retirees. So obviously, if we're paying money to retired to retired workers of the government, then obviously that's going to be a deduction of benefits available. Um, refunds for terminated employees. So obviously, if a if a terminated employee had had been participating in it, then they'll refund refund their their share, and then. Um, the administrative expenses of actually administering the, the pension plan. So these are some common additions and deductions that you will see within, within the pension plan reporting. Um, some additional disclosures for pension funds. Um, there is some required supplementary schedules, if you recall, um, the makeup of the financial section of, of um of these governmental financial statements requires um, supplementary schedules to be attached in certain circumstances. Um, so in regards to pension funds, the required supplementary schedules include a 10-year schedule of changes in net pension liability and related ratios, 
We also want to include a 10-year schedule of employer contributions. And we also want to include a 10-year schedule of investment returns. <clears throat> so this way, we don't only see the one at a, a point in time of where the pension fund resides or the level of investment or, or, um, or um, net assets or net liability. Um, we can actually see how it got there over at least a period of 10 years by, by seeing the employer contributions, the returns on investments, and um, the changes in the liability and re the related ratios. So very, very important RSI there, or re uh, required supplementary schedules, I'm sorry. Okay, so investment pools. Um, sometimes governments place excess cash from multiple funds into a single investment pool. Um, this is going to be known as an internal investment pool. Obviously, if, if they, they're using their excess cash from multiple funds within that government, that's going to be an internal pool. Um, state governments frequently open their investment pools to cities, counties, or school districts within the state to, who wish to participate within these external investment pools. Um, and obviously, that's, that's an external investment pool if, we're, if the government's allowing the cities and counties and school districts to participate within these. Um, it's important to note that if the investment pool is governed by a trust agreement, the cash deposited by the local governments for investment would be reported in an investment trust fund. But if there is not a trust agreement, the invested amounts would be reported in a custodial fund. The accounting is the same regardless of the fund type, obviously, because they're both fiduciary funds. Both fiduciary funds, obviously, are going to operate under the um, uh, accrual basis of accounting, the current resource, or I'm sorry, economic resource measurement focus. So accounting is the same, just, just knowing who it's governed by or if there's if there's an actual trust agreement is what's going to stipulate which, which fund is going to be used to account for the investments. <clears throat> so a little more on these, these types of investment pools, um, internal investment pools. Um, if the government money is pulled for efficient management, the individual investment balances should be shown on the balance sheet of the contributing funds of the government, not in an investment trust fund. So, <clears throat> so what's this saying exactly? So if for the internal investment pools purposes, so meaning that there's some excess cash laying around in these governmental funds. So the internal government or the, the actual government itself wants, wants to pull these resources together, right? Pull this excess cash together. Um, so what they're saying, if they do that and put that in an investment pool, then they really don't need to, they don't want to start an investment trust fund for it. They just want to just show that investment balance on their actual, um, on their actual financial statements relative to the fund that makes the investment. That's all they're saying there. Um, if you, if you would start that investment trust fund, it would just become too cumbersome. So it's easier just to keep the investment on the relative financial statements of the, of the participating fund. Um, and in terms of the external investment pools, these, these once again represent amounts held for other governments participating in the investment pool. Um, external monies are reported in a fiduciary fund, and these resources do not appear in the government-wide statements, obviously. Once again, external funds do not appear. Internal ones would, obviously, because they're the, the, um, the government's resources, but the, um, the external investment pools are not because whether it's the trustee or um, merely holding it in a fiduciary capacity. Uh, reporting by investment trusts. Investment trust funds use the accrual basis. Um, obviously, investments here are also going to be reported at fair value. Here, once again, both realized and unrealized changes in fair value are going to be reported as net increase or decrease in fair value of investments. Remember, there's no um, no bifurcation between the two or no separating of the two, if you want to say, of um, that of realized and unrealized changes in fair value. Both of them are going to be reported as net increases or decreases in fair value of investments. Um, special note disclosures show categories of investments. Um, <clears throat> so contribution and withdrawal of funds to external investment pools are going to be reporting in an entirely different section of the statement of changes in fiduciary net position. So if we can see here down at the bottom, so this is just a little excerpt of a financial statement down here. Um, um, so it's obviously an excerpt from the statement of changes in fiduciary net position. So if we were looking at that statement of changes in fiduciary net position, we would see that this is a little section here, um, the separate section they're talking about. And it says here, we can see the, 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 um, 
identity of this section of the statement is pool participant account transactions. So we can see deposits by investment pool participants at 2.5 million. <clears throat> Reinvestment and investment pool distributions of 61,000. Withdrawals by investment pool participants of 2.45 million. And total participant account transactions are going to equal 111,000. And obviously, that's the sum of the, the, the activities that we just accounted for within the pool participant account transactions portion of the statement of changes in fiduciary net position. So, just just main thing here, just, just note, note that. Um, that the, the contribution and withdrawal of funds um, are going to be reported in a separate section of this of this statement here. Okay, some common uses of custodial funds. Um, they're commonly used when a government holds assets temporarily that belong to another party. Um, these are going to include student activity funds of a school district. Um, Tax collection funds, where one government collects taxes on behalf of another government. We've talked about that in depth throughout this list lecture here, with the examples of sales tax in particularly, and also touched br briefly on motor fuel tax. Um, so that's a good example there. Um, jail inmate accounts. So if any anyone's in prison or jail, then um, if they have actual accounts, then that's that's where it's going to be held held in right there. Um, nursing home patient accounts, so same thing with nursing home patients, and also Section 529 college saving plans, which are offered by state governments. I'm sure everyone's probably, not everyone, but most people have heard of the Section 529 college saving plans. Um, a little more on the Section 529 college saving plans. Um, like I said before, most states do uh, do actually offer these, these type of college saving plans. Um, the coolest thing about these plans or the main advantage of these plans is that the investments um, with actually the amounts grow tax deferred and as long as the distributions for the beneficiaries college expenses um, are the as long as the distributions are used for the beneficiaries college expenses then they're exempt from tax so it's, it's nice you can actually put this money into this fund watch it grow over time tax is deferred um, so you're not incurring any taxes from from period to period and if, if you use it for what the purpose of the actual the actual plan was for, then you can even pull money out of the plan tax free. So it's it's really it's a nice little tax shield on on being able to grow your money, um, let your money work for you. Um, and another another cool thing about this section five twenty nine, I know it's not mentioned anywhere within in these slides or anything, but um, it's good to know that if if you start one of these for your for your child. Um, and then say, you know, you, you contributed this plan for 17, 18 years and you have a pretty good basis within your asset asset value in there. And and then say your your child decides he, he this college just isn't for him. He doesn't want to go. Um, you have two options you can either do. Um, if, if he foregoes the opportunity to go to college and pull the money out used for him, then anyone in the directly related family, um, so anyone like your spouse or a brother and sister or you know another another child that you have can actually use that money to go back to school so that's that's cool so as long as it's within the immediate family anyone can use that money to go to school and still receive the same benefit of being exempt from tax um, and obviously if no one wants to go to school and you you just have to account for it as a regular investment you're going to pull it out pay pay your um pay your penalty and your tax on it just as you normally would if you would pull from an early retirement. So pretty much just breaking the terms of what the plan is. But either way, um, that's just a little bit a little bit more on more detail on that Section 529 plan, something, something that everyone should look into. Um, it's a good, good little deal there. Um, typically, state governments engage in a mutual fund company that actually invest amounts received from depositors and keep records of individual investor balances. Um, families make contributions to these plans in the same manner they might to a private mutual fund. Um, however, under GASB guidelines, a liability would not be recognized upon the receipt of cash from the depositors. And this is so because there is no event that compels the state to disperse cash at that time. So it's a little, little, um, little, little different rule there. But that's just the way it is um, according to GASB guidelines. So once again, when, when 
when we make our contribution into that Section 529 plan. So let's say if my family has a Section 529 plan, anytime I make a contribution to that, that does not increase the liability of the government that sponsors that 529 plan. The only thing that's going to trigger a liability for them is when I actually want the money, when I'm going to go to school or when I pull the money out. So until that point in time, there is no liability. So at the point that the children um, of the donor families enter college, they may begin to withdraw funds from the Section 529 plan to pay for college expenses. So when a depositor requests to withdraw, the custodial fund should recognize a liability. Um, this is so because an event has now occurred that compels the state to make a payment. Because of this difference in timing recognition of the receipts and withdrawals, Section 529 plans typically report a non-zero fiduciary net position. So non-zero fiduciary net position. So obviously there's there's no liability because nothing's been compelled to make us do so. So it's a, it's a, it's a non-zero fiduciary net position. Um, let's see here. Tax collection funds. An activity that often results in the creation of a custodial fund is the collection of taxes or other revenues by an official of one government for other governmental units. <clears throat> So at the local governmental level, it's common for an elected county official to actually serve as a collector for all property taxes within the county. And similarly, state governments commonly collect sales taxes, gasoline taxes, and many other taxes that are apportioned between state agencies and local governments within the state. So once again, that's that's a perfect example. The, st the sales tax and the gasoline taxes, in my opinion, are, are the best examples for the tax collection funds or the custodial funds from which there is not an actual binding agreement. Um, <clears throat> recall that the general rule for recognizing a liability in a fiduciary fund is that an event has occurred that compels the government to disperse resources. So really, really recall that general rule. Remember, it's it's nice to keep up with these rules because if you know the rules, it's a lot easier to account for the activities and and to know know when you have to incur a liability. Um, so the general rule for recognizing a liability once again in a fiduciary fund is that an event has occurred that compels the government to disperse resources. So in the case of tax collection activities, the final recipient is not required to submit a request for payment. GASB guidelines provide a rule of thumb that's going to simplify this process for tax collection activities. If a government is expected to hold funds for three months or less, a liability may be recognized immediately for the amounts that will be paid to the final recipient. So pretty much what they're saying there, GASB's rule of thumb for these taxes being collected in the custodial account, if it's three months or less within 90 days per se, then they have to incur a liability. Um, the result is that for the tax collection custodial funds, additions equal deductions and the residual equity net position is zero. So obviously anything coming out goes coming in goes right back out because we're just collecting it and then remitting it. So we're just we're pretty much just an intermediary or you know pretty much for, for the transaction. So it's cheap property. Um, these are properties that are resources from unclaimed bank accounts and estates. Um, a sheet property is typically turned over to the state and the state searches for the owners of, of that a sheet property. Um, typically the state may keep part of unclaimed amount and return some to the local level. And the amount treated as net revenue to the state should be the amount they ultimately expect to be able to keep. So obviously they would like to be able to keep it all, but um, unfortunately if the rightful owners of this a sheet um, property comes forward and they have no choice but to remit it to them because it's theirs but in some cases they they can expect to be able to keep a portion of it so that's that's going to be the amount that they need to be treated as net revenue um, the escape property should be reported in either a private purpose trust fund or in the fund where the property ultimately escapes um, when the government takes over the property, it records the asset at its fair market value and an equal amount of gross contribution revenue. The dollar amount expected to be distributed to owners should be estimated and treated as an expense and a liability. So a um, little bit on a cheap property. Um, so that, that's going to cover through the actual content, the slides for, for this chapter. Um, so everyone just take some time and, and read through them, be working through your connect assignments. Um, let's see here, let's go back to Moodle one more time. So take, take be working on connect assignments. Once again, remember chapter seven connect assignments are due this Sunday at 11.59 p.m. 
um, shouldn't be too cumbersome. Just go ahead and get those in. And like I said, moving forward, we'll be on our normal normal pace that we were um, before before the midterm and before this COVID-19 mess came about. So um, just be on the lookout for the lectures um, moving forward. Like I said, my goal is to have the lecture, at least the initial lecture posted by Wednesday. Um, and if not, then then it'll be it'll be no later than that Thursday. Um, so this this gets us through the chapter seven PowerPoint slides, and um, I'll be doing a little more in depth diving with some of the typical transactions we would expect to see within fiduciary funds. Um, that should be posted no later than Friday of this week. And once again, if you have any questions or concerns related to any of the material, please reach out to me. I'm here to help you, and I hope everyone has a good day. And um, be on the lookout for the next lecture. Um, thank you for your time and have a good day.